Welcome to the AJ Brown Show, where we talk about all things investing, options trading, and the like. Now here's your host, AJ, whose primary mission in life is to help you become a better investor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the AJ Brown Show. We missed our episode last week. AJ was out in Central America on a wild adventure. AJ, welcome back. How are you feeling? I'm feeling a little sunburnt. I'm feeling a little sunburnt. We haven't actually got our studio completely set back up yet since I returned, so things look a little different, but all's good. All's good. Uh, and so real quick, uh, you know, when you when you run a business like this and you're a successful investor, you can take trips. So let's give the folks a little uh, a little glimpse into into what you did, because I don't know if a lot of people know, but you're a cool. big scuba diver, right? Like you're really into that. And so you yeah. went on a nice little adventure. Um, and what so so what trans we've got some photos and videos, but I just want to hear your you know, what were you getting into? Well, so yeah, uh, like you said, because I have all this freedom from having to have a nine to five job and having to worry about money and also with trade, especially the way that we talk about it, we, um, you know, we don't have to be, um, we do a lot of end of day stuff and end of day means anytime between when the market closes and when the market opens again is when you have to spend about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes kind of preparing for the next trading session. And then you set your trading platform to work on autopilot. And most trading platforms don't require very crazy uh, internet connections at all. They need like just minimal, even some of the most remote places I've been, I can still connect my automatic trading device to the internet and have it go to town or even better, um, have a, a computer at my home uh, that's connected all the time and then just connect into it, you know, periodically when the trading sessions are out. You know, you've got, what is it? The trading session is six and a half hours. So you have that other, what is it, 15 and a half hours to kind of figure out how to connect to your home computer, make it work. Anyway, you can go anywhere in the world and do whatever you want. And so one of my favorite things is scuba diving. I mean, I've been scuba diving since 1991. I became an instructor in the year 2001. I became an instructor trainer in 2002. And then I got into working with uh, folks with disabilities. So one of my favorite things to do is any, they're called adaptive scuba classes. And my, my, my specialty is working with folks that are paraplegics or quadriplegics and letting them have the same experience that able-bodied divers have. So, um, yeah, uh, I went down to Belize, uh, and I spent eight days, uh, really pursuing my passion, which is scuba diving. We went into the blue hole. Uh, and we did a whole bunch of just local diving, looking at all kinds of things. It's my favorite. And you mentioned earlier that you were swimming with sharks and we, we have a clip here mm -hmm. now. It's not a great white shark, but it's a shark, right? Um, and it so was that, a great barrier reef shark. It, and so that's gotta be kind of, uh, you know, exhilarating or some sort of emotion coming over you being next to among these mini predators. Yeah, it's true. Uh, those and we we there was barracuda beyond belief, though they have very nice big mouths. Um, yeah, all of that is super fun. There's a turtle that I, I got to hang out with a lot. Uh, quite a few eels, moray eels and spotted eels. But yeah, let's take a look at this uh, clip that my buddy got of me swimming with the shark. All right. AJ swimming with the sharks. Yeah. All right. Actually, that was a I I lied. That was that was a video of me with a nurse shark, not a great barrier reef, not a, a great reef shark, but a nurse shark. But yeah, that they're they're fun. They're fun. They're like little puppies. 
Yeah, and we we tried to do the show, but the connection just wasn't strong enough to do a full blown live stream. No, but but you could you said you could still check in on the markets and and trades and things like that. So that's that's the yeah. beauty of of being low in bandwidth it. stuff. Totally, totally. Um, well, while you were gone, I feel like the market has been getting ramped up. We there's been a lot of news coming out this week specifically. We had the chairman go go up on Capitol Hill, and they were grilling him uh you know pretty well and then today we had employment numbers and so getting back into the office today aj what are the vibes the feelings that you're getting from the market in general well first of all the uh let's talk about the chairman having his uh congressional questioning so he said some things and then he, he had to correct them on Wednesday, but the market wasn't having any of it. He basically said, listen, the data is coming in and we reserve the right with our monetary policy mandate to do whatever we want based on the data. So don't don't think you know what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to respond accordingly. And so that, you know, what the market it likes is predictability and when somebody who's in control of the levers comes in and says i'm going to be anything but predictable the market gets scared and so we, we're seeing some sell-off but when you look at my chart here you know we love our retracement analysis and i'm, I'm looking at it right here uh, that's where we compare the current move to the previous move and you can see that in our current retracement analysis, we, we started the current little downtrend. This is a medium duration downtrend on February 2nd. And it's been following so predictably that we've got our linear regression line here. We've got our parallel lines of support and resistance. And it, it's almost as if these, re, these short duration reversals are just totally following in line. To the point where uh, we can put some trust into these descending lines of support and resistance and and totally know where the market's going next. So we we expect, you know, we're coming to the bottom of this descending line of support. We expect for it to kind of reverse here and then go up, find descending resistance and come back down. So uh, we, we, you know, Sip and you and I talked about that. Once the year got going, uh, we were saying this back at the end of 2022, once 2023 got going again, we thought that there'd be some sell off, at least for a partial part of the year. And that's exactly what we're seeing. But again, if I zoom back out for about a year, um, we're in this sideways motion, as you can see here uh, over the last year, we may have kind of topped out, but it's not like we're going to any lowers. Uh, so what that tells me is, for those of you who are following us as far as selling premium, this is the perfect market for selling premium when the market's kind of just stalled, going up for a mid medium duration, down for a medium duration. We're in the right place at the right time. We just have to make sure we're on the right side of the equation in order to make the most money. In fact, the last thing I want to say, Sip, is if I look at the VIX, remember the VIX volatility index is um, kind of an explanation of how uncertain or how uh, fearful, because uncertainty and fear go together, the market is right now. And so you can see that's starting to creep up again. Right here in the last few days, we've been heading back up. And again, that just points to following our option trading strategies because our option trading strategies, we're selling into that fear. That means that we're making more money as option sellers. Right now, you don't want to be buying options. You want to be selling options, and that's what we're doing. So all of a sudden, our income that we're expecting to make every time an option expires has started to go up again. And so we're in the right place. And is part of the rationale behind the recent uh, downfall in the market, the idea that um, inflation isn't rising, but it isn't it isn't contracting as quickly, but also the employment market is mm -hmm. still strong. Right. And so the and, and a lot mm -hmm. of the congressmen or 
um, uh, representatives were asking the Fed chairman that isn't part of his plan to lose, to make sure that the economy loses jobs. And he was kind of defending that in the sense that that's one of the tools. And then we get today's employment number, which is so strong. So like it's the case that good employment is bad for the economy. Oh my gosh. It's so ass backwards, isn't it? That good news is bad news. But um, yeah, one thing I'd like to say is I'd like to explain to people about season adjustability. So when we look at these economic reports, and this is just as a side discussion, but when we look at these economic reports, like our, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. Uh, do, do, do. Mm -mm -mm. There it is. There. When we look at these economic reports, uh, like, for instance, today's employment situation, or if you remember, SIP, last time in January, our employment numbers were like through the roof. They're actually um, applying a coefficient, a adjust adjusting number to their results. What does that mean? Well, Say, for instance, if you're reporting on ice cream sales, you know, if you didn't seasonally adjust the reporting on ice cream sales, well, then in January, in the winter time, when it's freezing cold outside, you'd see this dip. And then in the summertime, you'd see this, 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 this crazy peak in the data and it would become very difficult to read. And so what these economists do, these people who measure the data, is they'll actually um, apply um, seasonal adjustability factors to kind of smooth out the data so that we can make policy decisions, investment decisions on that. The only problem with doing seasonal adjustability is when you have, for instance, an extra warm winter. Because in an extra warm winter, people might still be buying ice cream when usually when you look at like what's been happening over the last years in the winter, they don't buy ice cream. So now the numbers get over exaggerated because we apply this seasonal adjustability uh, factor to it when maybe it didn't have to be applied. And it's the same thing we do in charts. In charts, we use moving averages so that we can get away from the spikes and the troughs that otherwise would make the data unusable. So imagine trying to use a moving average where your data is coming from the pandemic. Like over the last five years, things have not been seasonably smooth, right? Because this pandemic has jumped in. And so these, I, I give it to these mathematicians who, you know, manipulate this data to create these reports that we make big decisions on, that the Fed makes big decisions on, that congressmen make uh, big decisions on, that us as investors make big decisions on. I give it to them. They have a very hard job. But this is all to say that perhaps these employment numbers that we saw last month and this month they may have been adjusted. And so uh, you talk, you and I talked last time we met about how they come back and they revise these numbers. I am going to expect that some of you will come back uh, revised down uh, from these hot numbers that were reported because, um, you know, we don't have these extreme movements like these reports have been telling us. So I think the economists will go back and be like, that initial number we gave, maybe we adjusted too much and it was an extra warm winter. Maybe, you know, some some economists are saying that climate change is having an effect on the seasonal adjustability and that because it's warm out, people aren't, you know, hunkering down. Instead, they're out and about and that's just messing up the data. So something for people to keep in mind is that these numbers are manipulated to try to smooth them out. But the smoothing factors are coming from uncertain times. So it's a lot of data manipulation. Can we can we take a look at the numbers today real quick to see if there's yeah. anything that stands out? Because I think it was a, a pretty large beat. Yeah. And I again, so you'll notice over here that last month, remember that 517,000 number blew people out of the- I mean, that's a big number, right? Month They've over month? Started, 
Yeah, but they already this month they already reduced it, right? Mm -hmm. They've already knocked it down. And I have a feeling they're going to keep, you know, what's funny about these reports and we get like this little summary snapshot, but when you delve in, they keep revising these numbers like for three or four months after they initially release them. So, um, and you can see here, they did expect uh, 223,000. And what we got here was uh, 311,000. So that's better than expected. Um, but you can also see here, this is a different, uh, number, the unemployment rate, it's going up. So this is a different survey that they do. So even though the number of jobs that are created increased, there's also a lot of people who are starting to be out of work. And so, you know, one of the questions that a lot of economists say is, besides looking at the sheer number of jobs, how about looking at the jobs multiplied by how much the jobs pay to kind of understand are people now getting employed at lower paying jobs? Is that why this number is going up? But this number is going up as well. Um, if you look over here, the average hourly earnings are less than what was expected. So they, you know, this is telling us that the Fed's tactics are starting to work. Again, they'd like this number to be around 2%. But they were expecting 4.7 and it came in at 4.6. You can see that people are working less. So there's a lot, lot of, of focus inside the report, not just the high level numbers that get said by the media. So, you know, I, I take this with like a grain of salt uh, because um, the Fed, you know, they have a lot more. Remember, they have their three tools. They have their rhetoric, which is what they used big time this week. And then they have interest rates and they have bonds. And I would, it comes to investors. I think uh, after the report this morning, uh, the likelihood of a half point rate hike increased significantly. So I think that's what a lot of the uh, the bond traders are expecting. Um but that is the let's, let's take a look at the CME Fed watch tool. So this is that tool that we've looked at before. So, yeah, two weeks ago we checked in on this and this was about, if I remember correctly, about two thirds of investors thought it was going to be a quarter point rate hike and one third thought it would be a half point rate hike. And like you said, this has totally changed. Now investors only just a little bit more than 55 percent, 57 and a half percent think that this is going to be a quarter point rate hike. And now this number has increased. This is almost half, 42 and a half percent think it's going to be a half point rate hike. All right. Well, the uh, the market looks unchanged for the first hour and a half of trading. Um, so it seems like they're trying to digest the news. Uh, whether the market mm -hmm. goes up, down, or sideways, uh, you and the team here at Trading Trainer have strategies to approach the market. And so uh, yeah. if anyone watching or listening hasn't checked out AJ's uh, free daily workshop, we're going to go ahead and throw the link into the chat. So if you want to get a deeper dive into uh, how, they, how the team approaches investing using options, premium selling, um, we're going to go ahead and throw the link, give you access to that in the chat. We're going to play a little commercial. We're going to take a break. Um, if you have a specific ticker symbol that you want AJ to review, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Otherwise, we'll be back in a few minutes, seconds. So I get it. You're afraid of trading in the markets. Guess what? I've got your answer. I've got four strategies I'm going to give you along with the tools to make it super easy. I'm going right home giving you the webinar. I need you to sign up below and meet me in a few minutes. I, I imagine that's how you uh, how you showed up to the airport in the Tesla. Get me get me down to the cove mm. and jump in and swim with the sharks. It was actually a Model Y. My my Uber driver was driving a Model Y and he was driving awesome. It was awesome. Uh, well, that's that's good to, uh, that you were able to take a break. Um, go do something that you're passionate about. Highly encourage everyone to kind of take that approach. Um, if you haven't checked out the webinar, go ahead and check it out. 
Um, otherwise, we've got a couple tick- tickers that we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks. Um, I think the first one that you want to mm-hmm. discuss is, uh, well, why don't you you go ahead and Let's call talk it out. Norwegian Cruise Lines. All right. Yeah, Norwegian Cruise Lines. Yeah. And so I wanted to, this is, again, I got to hand it to my crew. I, and when I say my crew, I mean my program participants. Every Thursday, we have a workshop where, you know, the way that this workshop works is I have taught my folks, you know, I've given them steps on how to screen the best candidates. So then I send them off and I say, go find some good candidates to uh, plan out, have some trades going on, have some positions. And I said, you know, what would be cool is if you come to the workshop and you send me those tickers and um, we'll give you a final, you know, I'll give you a look right on the workshop and all the other people who who are attending the workshop will get kind of a peek at how I decide want to pursue versus which candidates don't fit my criteria. So it was the candidate, one of our users. Now this is, uh, we featured it on this show before because it is a very, nicely tradable uh, symbol for selling premium against. This is Norwegian Cruise Lines. And so you can see this channel that we're in. In fact, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see that we have the minimum requirements of a channel, which means we have at least two tests of support and we have at least two tests of resistance. And so because we've tested support and tested resistance twice, this makes this a more um, consistent or sustainable channel, uh, because now all of a sudden, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, meaning that when, uh, investors see that this has been tested twice, they have more confidence that it's going to get tested a third time. And so they start making decisions with their trading, basically calling their broker and saying, Hey, around $11, 75 cents, around $12, start buying because these two previous times, it looks like the low has been found. So if I want to buy low, let's start buying around $12. Well, that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because if there's buying at $12, we create, you know, when there's buying, it makes price go up. Same thing about the top. So they might say, hey, uh, I've seen that the Price doesn't go any higher than $18. So they call their broker and they say, hey, broker, that, you know, that stock that I bought for $12, let's put in a sell order when it hits $18. And of course, that's how support and resistance kind of keeps proliferating. Now, when we see these channels, sideways channels, we can take advantage of selling premium into them and doing what we call legging into them. That means uh, instead of doing a buy right, which means buying stock and selling the call all on the same day in the same transaction, we can buy down here and sell up here. And that's basically what we do. Now, the cool part is, is we've hit our top and we're on our way back down. It's almost like we're reloading our rifle and we're going to get an opportunity to do this trade all over again. And for those people who got into the trade the last time, You get to basically continue it moving forward. You get to, you know, sell your protective option and you get to start, you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. And that whole repeat part is what we like so much because it creates that income stream for us. Every time we rinse and repeat, that's another paycheck that comes our way. But the reason why I wanted to feature this and the reason why the folks uh, in my program decided that this was a good candidate to do last night was because it's crossing from the top to the bottom of the channel. And when it kind of hangs out here in the center of the channel, this is the perfect time to reset your trade plan, right? As good traders, we like to plan out our trade, and then we like to trade that plan that we planned out. And so right now, I just want to tell all the users, Norwegian Cruise Line is at that place where you should sit down and create your trade plan, which means you want to define exactly what do you need to see in order to do the trade. 
And not only what do you need, in other words, what signal has to happen, but not only define what signal you need to see, but also to, you know, calculate the risk and define how much of my portfolio can I trade and what sort of price targets must I hit in order to meet the risk and the reward uh, targets that I have. So what sort of price thresholds do I have to adhere to? So get that plan in place. Now is the time to make that plan. We're at the perfect place in the movement where you can do a good planning of your trade. And then as we swoop down closer to the $12 mark, we'll start executing on this new plan. And so that's why I wanted to feature Norwegian Cruise Line. So I have a quick question on that. And like the setup looks uh, very quality, right? Like if you get down to that 12, like you mm -hmm. said, there's some nice resistance there. So if I'm, if I have my plan in order, when do I start putting mm -hmm. my trades on? Can I, can I put my trades on now right. and hope that they get filled in the future? Or do I wait till we get to those prices and then fill in the future? And is there a benefit or a negative to doing, approaching it either way? Yeah. So what I teach my folks to do is check in every evening. So what for is you're looking for one with the downward movement. So we call it a reversal. We look for the reversal to happen. And so you can use any sort of indicators. We like using the fast MACD or we like using some trends of like the RSI and the MACD and the MACD average and just price in general. <coughs> And so you identify that reversal and that is your trigger to do the first part of your trade, the first leg, which if you're not already in the position, this is where you would set up your initial covering position. So your initial covering position would be that position that allows you to then sell premium when you're up here at the top. So yeah, we set up our initial covering position when we find that reversal. And then we wait patiently. And when we find the opposite reversal, that's when we sell our premium. We set up our income trade and we also buy some protection for this trade. Buying the protection up here means you're going to get it at the cheapest price. So like you said, this is these are all daily bars, right? And so there's no day trading here. All you're going to wind up doing is, um, you know, uh, coming in in the evening, seeing if a reversal, you know, if the, the signal you set up to detect reversals has flipped. If it does, then you're going to, you know, set up your trading platform to make the trade the next day. And then you're going to wait patiently. It looks like it's around maybe a three or four week wait period. And at the end of that four weeks, you're going to set up your income trade. And now you're in the cycle. This trade looks like it could easily last five, six, seven months. And all you're going to do is about once a month, look for the, the opportunity. The premium expires because we use three to five week out options. So the premium expires and you just collect the money and you just simply roll out the protection every month and you get a new, uh, uh, a new protective option. And that's all. Once you've got the initial covering position in place, Sip, it's just about maintaining the trade with one to adjust the lock. All right. Well, uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines, that's a ticker that we've been looking at uh, the last couple of weeks. We'll definitely keep that one on the watch list. Uh, we did have a question come in that I think is a, a very good question because we discussed it earlier in the show. And that was that spike in the VIX. And so Maria is asking, um, is there a trade there or is it too late because of the uh, spike already? No, Mari, this is awesome. Okay. So what, what we're talking about here is a trading strategy that I've shared on the show a couple of times. This is where we use the VIX to hedge against our whole portfolio. So let's just have a quick review of what that is. So a lot of people think that you can trade the VIX the same way that you can trade a stock, but it's not the same thing, right? A stock or an index or an ETF, these are assets that over time will 
especially when you're looking at an index, grow. The VIX is a measurement of uncertainty and of fear, and it's a measurement of confidence. And so we don't usually, when you look over time, have an overall increase in fear over our lifetime, right? If anything, we have moments that are, you know, where we're uncertain, and then we have just as many moments where we're confident. And that's what you can see. I'm showing you a graph right now of the VIX since its creation back in the 1980s. So each one of these bars actually represents a month of time. And so you can see over all of its time, we've had some moments where we get really afraid, but just an equal number of amount of moments below the white line where we're confident, where we feel good about things. And so what we can do is create a trade on this, especially based on another kind of observation you can make. And that is when we feel confident, we get to a certain level of confidence. And the, the, the way you look at this is the more we you know, deviate from the center line, the more confident we get. And on the other direction, the more we deviate from the center line up, the more fearful we get. So you can see that, you know, just looking at the general amount of time that we're fearful versus confident, it's about equal. But when we become afraid, we become afraid. And when we become confident, we don't really become any more confident than a certain amount. That's kind of, and, and it's really interesting that we can use trading like this to really understand the human psyche, that people only get to a certain level of confidence, but when they get scared shitless, they really do. Like people get afraid. And so what, what she's talking about is we can actually create a trade based on the fact that people don't get any more confident than a certain amount. We can create a spread trade, a vertical spread trade, where this creates a credit for us. And then we can create another spread trade, a debit spread. And we can use that credit to offset the cost of that debit. And that winds up creating a break-even trade. Maybe we can make a little bit of a profit on that. Um, like the idea every month when you place this trade or every cycle, I should say, is that you're not going to in normal times really make that much money. You're probably going to cover your commissions and maybe make a percent or two. Um, you could probably do way better uh, using this trade than just putting your money into a mutual fund or something like that. But you're not going to have home runs with this trade except for when the proverbial poop hits the fan. Because when the proverbial poop hits the fan and this debit spread that we have over here, all of a sudden price spikes above that debit spread, this thing will pay back like 400%. And so a lot of times when the proverbial poop hits the fan, the rest of our trades in our portfolio, you know, they, they wind up maybe not, uh, um, uh, doing bad unless you're more of a, a directional trader, then your portfolio hits the ground, but um, they end, right? It, having fear spike up like it has in the past um, doesn't fare well with most people's portfolios. And so this trade, you know, all of a sudden when fear pops up, giving us a four times return, um, that can often offset um, and any sort of, of disruption that happens in the rest of your portfolio. So that's what Mari's talking about. So she wants to know specifically, so we're going to stop looking at the all-time map and come back into this little six months. She said, is it spiked up too much to place this trade? And the answer is, is no. Usually what we do is we place these trades. So you're going to create your debit spread down here or I'm sorry, your credit spread down here. And now you're just going to pick the strike prices up here. And the key is getting this thing. Don't worry about, 
you know, how much reward you're going to get if the proverbial poop hits the fan. The way you want to construct this is you want to construct it to make sure that this um, credit spread pays for this debit spread and that you wind up making some money. So you can still very much construct this trade accordingly. And then if the VIX shoots up above that, um, you're going to be in a good position. And if it doesn't, that's all right too. But yeah, just this one day yesterday of up, we're not out of the range of normal. The range of normal is about 18 to 24. When we start to get abnormal is when we get above 28, get into the 32 like we did not that long ago. In September, we had jumped up. Uh, so yeah, you're still, you're still in a good position. Just make sure that you get those two vertical spreads to offset each other. Don't take a loss on this trade. You, your goal is to make it break even. So pick your strike prices accordingly. It's great. It's in, yeah. It's interesting how you say that we can only get so confident, right? Like, like in the future, I wonder if there will be a day where we'll be like, this is the VIX at the all time lowest it is the most confident we've ever been in <laughs> 25 plus years. Yeah. You know, the, I, I've been watching the VIX for almost 30 years now and the VIX, I mean, personally on a real time basis, and I've only seen the VIX dip below $10 like a few times in my whole, you know, 30 years of watching it. So, you, you know, the the um, average area is at about $19.50. And so going down to $10, that's about a $9 movement. But now look over here. Going up to $32 just in the last six months, that's way more than $9. That's like $12, $13. That's something that happens often. Like when we get scared, we get scared. But when we're confident, we only get, get so confident. It is very interesting to just think about that and also apply it to your own life. You, you know, this is an average of, of everybody specifically everybody who's involved in the markets but you could always you know uh it's my motto to be better than everybody else so why not uh you know be happy when you're happy like really be happy um but yeah it, it's a i it's one of the reasons why i like the market sip a, a lot of people who come to me are like hey i'm an engineering student just like you i've got math i know all how to like you know do the math can i will i be successful at the markets and I have found, you know, being somebody who has two bachelors in engineering and one master's in engineering, that I wish I had a degree in psychology because it's actually psychology that controls the markets versus math. Very few people invest using math. More people invest using their emotions. And it, emotions are a great way, a great window into what the human psyche is. So I wish I knew more about psychology. I had gotten more formal training in psychology. Well, you know, uh, we, we can always learn more. And that's kind of one of the mottos at uh, Trading Trainer in that you want to have you want to empower new investors you want to empower people that have portfolios who haven't used this wonderful tool of options and we're teaching and we're learning and the markets are constantly evolving um we have been talking over the past couple of weeks um in in terms of what could be what are the reasons why the market starts to fall off and that is that ratio of savings to credit right and so um, is that one of the factors that's starting to drive the user experience, the you, the buying power down, even though we're getting these like bumps in employment numbers? Hmm. Yeah. Again, you know, there's a lot of lot of voices right now uh, raising about you know what we actually measure success on. You know, is success the number of people employed, or is success the amount that people bring home in income every year, right? Because you could be employed, you could have two or three jobs, and each job is underpaying you. And so you're working a lot. And so is that success that you're able to keep on three jobs? Or should we be measuring that differently? And you and I have been looking at 
that savings rate and that expenditures rate and that income rate. And we know that the income rate's going up, right? We know that there's more people employed. There's more money going out to these people. But we also know that because of inflation and all of that good stuff, things are costing more. In fact, things are costing more. That's at a faster rate than the money that... So our paycheck is growing by 10%. But when we go to the store or we go to the coffee shop or the restaurant, things have increased in price by 15%. So it actually turns out that even though our paycheck is getting higher, things cost more. So it, it doesn't really help that the paycheck is higher. And people have yet to curb their spending. And we're seeing it a little bit. And it, it, there's a whole bunch of different factors. But uh, spending rate seems to be just as high as it has been. Um, it's not slowing down very much. And so where are people getting all this extra money? So when you start to take a look at their savings rate, their savings rate is starting to dwindle. They're using money in their savings account. And they're also we're also seeing the amount that people are borrowing. So people are like borrowing money because they don't want to stop buying. But at the same time, they're not making as much as things cost. So at some point here, we're going to see probably a wall hit where people are like, oh, my God, I owe too much on my credit card. My savings account has dwindled. I'm just going to stop, stop buying stuff. And I feel like, like that's going to hit perhaps abruptly, like in March or April. So we're going to have to keep our eye out for that sip. And that I bet you then the VIX will go up. That's what quickly. I was thinking. So that's I, when, I, Mari, that's why you want to have your trade on now. Um, yeah. All yep. right. Well, well, we've got kind of a uh, a shortened episode here today. Um, AJ's just getting back from his trip um, and we're getting caught up on a bunch of things. Uh, we do want to give everyone the opportunity that if you're enjoying AJ's commentary, if you uh, if you think that it, th these things are uh, something that you would like to learn, get a little bit more in-depth knowledge on. AJ has a one-on-one -on -one coaching program that I'm going to throw the link to in the chat. And I know that it's been getting a lot of traction. Uh, there may be a seat or two available. So if you want a little bit more hand-holding, working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, asking these, these types of questions, having that perspective, um, a, the one-on-one -on -one coaching program is great. If you have a portfolio uh, that is of decent size and you're not using options, this is a great way to get involved, especially with some of the headwinds that we see on the horizon. So we're going to throw that into the chat so that everyone can check it out. Um, it's the first 10 days in March, AJ. What should we be looking forward to? What are we keeping our eye on the rest of the month, maybe even the rest week or so? Yeah, you know what? Now is the opportunity, uh, and I say this I think every week, but now is the opportunity to be selling premium. We looked at the overall uh, VIX. We know that the VIX is going higher. So selling options is where you're going to make money, not buying options. If you buy options, you better optimize them so that the premium is not expensive. But I mean, I'm telling you guys that this market with its medium duration to long duration movements like this, but overall sideways, this is where premium selling, I mean, you can't think of a better time to go do these type of trades. And so if you don't know what I'm talking, and we had somebody ask, um, I think I did a speaking event right before I hit, hit the road for Belize. And somebody asked and said, Man, this seems so straightforward. Why aren't all investors doing these type of trades? And I don't really have an answer for that because it is straightforward. I think it's just that, that there's kind of a, a a fear or mental block against the use of options. Um, I think that there's a, kind of a reputation that options can get you into trouble, and they can which is why I think you need to 
you know, find somebody who knows what they're do doing to show you how to use options correctly. Like if you use options as a stock substitute, a leveraged stock substitute, right now you could get yourself into a lot of trouble. And if you don't use good risk management techniques, you're totally setting yourself up for, uh, you know, a quick demise of a portfolio. But if you put yourself on the correct side of the equation, meaning right now options are becoming expensive, and so we should be in the market of selling these options and making, figuring out how to make an income stream off of those options. So if you can find somebody and uh, who can right. show you how to use options in this way, it becomes the opposite of a risky uh, investment vehicle and becomes more of like a no-brainer. And I think it's just people the complexity of options scares people away. Uh, the way that I like to look at it, um, and I think you've you've done a good way of bridging the concept, is uh, if we see the storm coming, right, which we're starting to get some glimpses of there may be a storm coming, we want to be in the business of writing insurance policies and getting that premium. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the idea of premium selling. And it's as simple as that. And so... The business is a brewing because the people are seeing the storm. And so we as premium mm -hmm. sellers should be out there looking for opportunities to sell these premium with our risk parameters in place and things like that. And so um, we encourage everyone to do it. And we encourage everyone that if you don't know how hop into one of those webinars, uh, send us a DM, send us a message and AJ and the team will definitely uh, p send you in the right direction because we have the resources. You've been doing this for 20 years. And so um, that's the moral of the story in March. If you're not selling premium, what are you waiting for, right? Yep, exactly. And, and the other thing that I think people, in fact, you know, I love that metaphor that people see the storm a brewing and we want to be in the business of selling in per insurance policies so that, you know, cause there is a market for it. In fact, people are, the VIX is telling us that people are willing to pay more. I also think people are, uh, they, they confuse trading options with day trading that you have to be that active in order to be successful trading options. And I'm perfect example that that's not true because I trade for each one of my positions. I do maybe one or two transactions per month. So right now my portfolio has 11 positions in it. So yeah, I'm doing 22 transactions, maybe 11 to 22 transactions per month. I'm not day trading by any means. I'm doing maybe one trade every other day. Sometimes I do two trades in a day and then I'm I'm not trading very often at all, and I know exactly what I'll be trading the night before. And so um, some people think that, oh, he must be option trading. That means he's sitting in front of his computer. I'll tell you I'm not. I'm, If anything, I'm under the ocean by 60 feet, and I'm swimming with sharks. Um, so I'm definitely not in front of my computer every day, but yet I've got this income stream rolling in. Um, it's a different yeah. it's a different kind of danger. Uh, before we head out of the show, we did have a, a last minute question came in that I think is one that a lot of people think. So I'm going to go ahead and put put it put it on the screen and go ahead and read it out. And cool. it looks like this is Jason. And Jason's question is, if I don't have much invested in the stock market at the moment, but have about 5K that I want to start with, would you still be able to utilize selling options premium? A friend has referred me to you. AJ, great question. You know what? I've seen people sell options premium on portfolios as small as $800. Now, with that small of a portfolio, you're limited to what you can sell premium on. Actually, you're at the beginning of the sweet spot. So the beginning of the sweet spot is about $5,000. So if you have a $5,000 portfolio, especially if it's in one of these tax-free or tax-deferred accounts because you can do most of the option premium selling strategies in those tax-deferred and tax-free accounts. But 5K is a great number to start with. And you'll see very quickly, especially if you don't start pulling money out, but you let it work and build, that that 5K will grow to 20K and then grow to 40K and then 80K and then 100k by the end of you know by the end of next year if you start now 
um, your portfolio be quite sizable to the point where maybe you could start start taking some some money off of it and spending it for you know happy things. So uh, yeah, five k is a good number. Awesome. And then just to that, we have had some examples on the show of uh, of fairly priced stocks, right? Like like three, four, five, six dollars, mm -hmm. which are would allow you to you know be have a little bit more flexibility with those types Absolutely. of names. So I would go back and maybe see um, or reach out and, and we could uh, give you those videos because we we put them all on YouTube. So thanks for the inquiry, AJ. Great great answer. Um, Eight hundred dollars. I mean, you probably want a little bit more, but that's a great starting spot for Jason. So I hope that he takes on this new concept of selling premium as the storm of brews. With that being said, yep. uh, I think we're you know at the end of the show here. Uh, we're going to be looking for some names the rest of the week. If anybody has any questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to send us a DM, leave a comment. If you've enjoyed the broadcast, hit that like, hit that follow, hit that subscribe button. AJ, thank you for your time. I mean, that tan is looking killer on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Belize has a hot sun. Um, all right, AJ, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you guys next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning into the AJ Brown Show. If you're interested in learning more about AJ and his investing techniques, head on over to tradingtrainer.com and create your free account today. And if you're not already a subscriber to the show, hit that subscribe button and we'll get you fresh content daily.